My name is Kevin Reddick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. I believe that by sharing experiences and insights, we can learn to grow uh, together and from one another in our faith and understanding of God's word. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button, uh, like us, and visit our channel for more engaging and enlightening videos. Our conversation today will basically address the importance of doors and keys. So to jump in the car with me and let's ride. I want to speak to you about two very powerful symbols, doors and the keys that open them. We see them every day in our houses and our workplaces and our communities. Some of us may take them for granted while others may see them as barriers or obstacles. But when we look deeper, doors hold a much more profound meaning. They are not just physical barriers, but also they represent opportunity and challenges. They can signify blessings, freedoms, and new beginnings. In our culture, we often equate power with the ability to kick doors open, to forcefully uh, uh, break our way through any obstacle that stands in our way. And we see this mentally at our jobs, and personally in our personal lives and, lives and relationships, where we believe that having authority or the, the, the right to something automatically grants us access. There are some doors that will not budge no matter how hard you kick at them, no matter how hard you beat on them, no matter how hard you throw your shoulder into them. <laughs> You see, doors are not meant to be opened by force. They require something much more powerful. They require a key. You see, when we try to uh, force open doors using our own strength and power, we often end up feeling frustrated and defeated. But when we use the keys that have been provided for us or the keys of the kingdom of God, we tap into a higher power and open doors that we never thought possible. There are many types of doors in our lives. Now, whether it's the doors of opportunity or the new trend of barn doors in your home, <laughs> doors are a symbol of opportunity. In fact, doors are so common in our lives that we pass through them as often as 20 or more times a day without hardly noticing. In fact, they are so common that they have become a metaphor for many things in our lives, including birth, death, change, empowerment, education, and new beginnings. And those are just a few of the ideals often expressed by a door or doorway. George Washington Carver once said, education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom. Coco Chanel stated, don't spend time beating on a wall, hoping to transform it into a door. In other words, don't waste time trying to create a door where there is none. Use your time to locate a door uh, 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 where there is actually a door and to educate yourself regarding how to use the key that opens it if it's not already open. Family, don't be discouraged by closed doors in your life. God has provided keys to doors of life on earth and keys to the kingdom of heaven. Also, have faith that he will open the right doors at the right time and obey his instructions. One of my favorite movies is The Adjustment Bureau. In the movie, on the brink of winning a seat into the U.S. Senate, ambitious politician played by Matt Damon meets a beautiful contemporary ballet dancer played by Emily Blunt in whom he falls deeply in love with. However, mysterious men conspire to keep the two apart. Matt learns he is up against the agents of faith itself, the men of the Adjustment Bureau. They have a plan for Matt that are determined to 
guide his life. And the plan was created by what, who is called the chairman. The plan called for uh, Matt to meet Emily only once, and he is told to forget her. Harry, one of the men who was assigned to interrupt Matt from meeting Emily a second time, tells him about his role as a caseworker in Matt's life. He's sometimes referred to as an angel. He also hints that the quote, chairman, is a euphemism for God. Matt races across town fighting the Bureau's ability to control his choices to ensure he will meet Emily again. And during the chase, the men or the angels of the Bureau uses doors to travel far across the city of New York. The doors allow the men to track people by teleporting through the doors. When they enter a door in one location, they actually exit it in a new location. And in order to walk through the doors, they had to have a key. And the key was the hats that the men wore. Now I interpret the hats to represent operational knowledge and understanding of the doors and their keys. And this is what I would like to discuss further with you today. The keys, and the key to their power and ability. When I think of keys, my mind goes back to Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was my elementary school janitor, and I was always impressed by all of the keys he had on his belt. I thought he could go anywhere in the school he wanted to with all those keys. I remember thinking, how did he know which key went to where, how to use the keys? I remember thinking that all those keys meant he had a lot of possessions, a lot of things to keep locked up. <laughs> and that's the dilemma, really, we find ourselves in as citizens of the kingdom of God. We have all these keys clipped on our belts called scriptures. We carry them around proudly because they are an expression of who we are and, and, and whose we are. And like I was as a child, others who see and hear the keys are impressed at the number of them. But the truth is, whether you have two keys or 200 keys, it makes no difference if you don't know how to use them. If you don't know what locks and doors they open. Napoleon Hill stated, you are searching for the magic key that will unlock the door to the source of power, and yet you have the key in your own hands, and you may use it the moment you learn to control your thoughts. This statement indicates that there are that there is really a key to understanding and utilizing keys. See, just having keys or access to keys is not enough. Having a key does us no good if we don't know the purpose of the key, where to find the key, and how to use them, and what uh, locks it unlocks, and what doors it allows to be open. In John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Jesus is providing us with a key. And he declares, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now my question to you is, can you find the key? The key is contained in the statement, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. The key is prayer. See, this key is not to be used for our selfish purposes, but for the glory of God, the fulfillment of his will on earth, and the advancing of his kingdom. Prayer is how we grant God and heaven permission to intervene in our affairs on earth. 
the spiritual legality of God and the heavenly host operating on earth is another lesson that God may cover at another time. But for now, understand that prayer grants the permission and the invitation for God and the principles, laws, and benefits of his kingdom to function on earth and our lives. Now let's talk about the keys of the kingdom of God. These are not physical keys, but spiritual ones that unlock the doors of blessings and opportunities in our lives. Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 19 states, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This means that when we align ourselves with God's will and use the keys of faith, trust, and obedience, we have the power to unlock heavenly blessings in our lives. So what are these keys? Well, some of them are faith, trust, and obedience. See, when we have faith in God's plan for our lives, trust in his timing and obey his commands, we are giving access to doors that lead to our destinies. Others are the principles, precepts, laws, and rules, and systems by which the kingdom functions and others are keys of authority to bind and loose. Keys must be learned and applied by the citizens in order to appropriate the benefits and privileges of the kingdom. Because Peter was the first to confess the revelation of Jesus Christ, he got his commission before the rest of the disciples. And with these keys, on the day of Pentecost, he was the first to open the door of faith to the Jews, and then in the person of Cornelius to the Gentiles. Hence, in the list of the apostles, Peter is always named first, but this was not purpose to elevate Peter above the rest of the apostles. The authority not only belonged to Peter, but to all who share in this proclamation of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. And that includes you and I. And remember, we're talking about keys. Not a single key that opens the door to salvation, as some believe. Also keep in mind that we are talking about the kingdom of God. Put in another term, the government of God. I believe Jesus was referring to uh, referencing God's government in this discussion with the disciples because of where he chose to have this discussion and the terms he used in speaking to his disciples. Also, Jesus' timing and location were perfect, of course. They provided the backdrop for an illustrative lesson on what could uh, 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 be done with keys issued by the government and correctly used. I'm saying this because Caesarea Philippi was a region that was gifted. In other words, uh, uh, Philip was given the keys to. <laughs> Philip the Tetrarch, who was really the only good son of Herod the Great. It was formerly known as Pantheus, named after the Greek god Pan who had shrines there. The region was strongly identified with various religions. It had been the center for Baal worship, and Herod the Great had built a temple there to honor Augustus Caesar. But with the keys now in possession of Philip, he beautified and enlarged the region, and, and, and uh, it became known as a quiet, peaceful retreat. Philip changed his name to Caesarea uh, uh, in honor of the Roman emperor and added, added Philippi after his name to distinguish it from the other Caesarea in the region. It was here that Peter received the promise from Jesus that upon the rock of Peter's confession of faith, he would build his church. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. And it has been misinterpreted as meaning church because of its view as a religious term. 
However, it is more of a governmental term. It means called out ones. It was a term the Greeks used in reference to their Senate and other political groups chosen by the government. The Greeks invented the concept of democracy, but never really applied the keys of the concept. So when the Romans overran the Greek empire, they maintained much of the political structure, but they also uh, uh, used the keys of democracy and developed it. And this is how Caesar developed such a powerful, strong, and successful government. According to the late Dr. Miles Monroe, he stated, the fact that Jesus used ecclesia to describe the body of followers that he was establishing tells us two things. First, the word church itself is a political rather than a religious term. And second, this entire discussion about keys and about binding and loosing is not a religious, but a political discussion. Unquote. In addition, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 tells us that Jesus came with something on his shoulder. It was government. Jesus came with the government on his shoulders that the Israelites rejected in the wilderness. See, the organization of, 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 of Mount Sinai was unique in that it consisted in the formation of the tribes into a theocracy, meaning the rule of God. The essence of this type of government is set forth by divine revelation in, Ex in Exodus uh, chapter 19, verses five through six. Primarily, it was a rule of God over a nation that was to be holy and a kingdom of priests. The people act for a king like the other people groups around them had. And as many of us know, that didn't work out well for the Israelites. And knowing this, God ordained the natural human birth of his son. And through this same avenue, uh, 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 this time actually, without asking our opinion, <laughs> he gives us a king. You know, every government has culture, principles, rules, laws, and order as its foundation. These things are important for us to identify and, and understand so that we can properly use the keys to open the doors and locks that they are purposed to. Keys are used in scripture as a symbol of authority and power. Giving keys to a person signifies the entrusting of that person with an important charge. And keep in mind what Jesus said. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. He didn't say keys to the kingdom. You see, we don't need keys to get into the kingdom. Uh, we're already in the kingdom through our confession of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. No, the keys of the kingdom are to express and demonstrate the governmental function, power, and authority within or of the kingdom. Consider this. You just purchased your first house. The realtor hands you two keys, one for the front door, one for the back door. Yet there are 16 rooms with locks on the doors inside. Now you ask, where are the other keys? <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, you can't have them. When you demand them, you pay for them. <laughs> now this brings up another point. Having the right to go through a door doesn't make the door open for you. You need the combination of authority, right, and keys. Something else we need to understand regarding being citizens of the kingdom and its keys. Now, allow me to use the illustration of a trip to Disney. I mean, we, 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 we purchase, we pay a price for the tickets to enter into the park. That purchase includes access to all of the attractions in the park. However, 
within the park, you need additional purchasing power. You need additional keys. You need additional money. <laughs> you need that in order to obtain food, drinks, gifts, fogos, and other knickknacks there. You see, uh, 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 they are the keys of the kingdom that unlock and, and make accessible the benefits and privileges of being a citizen that are beyond being able to enter into the kingdom, beyond being saved. In Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, it says, laying the keys of the house of David upon his shoulders. That statement signifies a transference of the supremacy of the kingdom, which was declared in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. And that states, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah was giving us a, a heads up here. <laughs> he says, for unto us a child is born, a savior. But the statement child is born is key here. See, essentially the word refers to the action of giving birth and its result. The result is that of bearing children. In the Old Testament, children are were considered a gift from God, instruments of God's activity, and symbolically a guarantee of the covenant between God and the people of Israel. In the New Testament, children are principally a model or image for the believer to emulate. The capital C in child in, in the text lets us know this is no ordinary child. This is the savior who had to be born in the natural order through a woman first so that he could operate legally in this physical realm with the physical body. Second, he had to have human blood that flowed from a divine source. Why? So that the blood could be applied and the flesh killed to pay the price for our sins. It says, unto us a son or a king is given. The key statement here is son is given. The capitalization of the letter S in the word son lets us know that it does not refer to a human son as the term child did. This son is being given by God. The Hebrew word for son is Bain, and it means a builder of the family name. He is being given by God. The family name he is to build is God's family, his kingdom. The term is given takes us back to the concept of being placed or seated. So Jesus is placed, he's given in the earth, as son slash king who will build the family name, the name of God, the kingdom of God, and the family name always stemmed from the father. So all the various names we come to know God as and through uh, uh, by scripture, Jesus come to build upon that and expand that. And as children, uh, uh, that uh, 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 who emulates our bigger brother, our older brother, we are to also advance that kingdom and therefore establish his kingdom here on the earth. And in doing that, we also assist in building the family name. Jesus is the son king because he stems from royalty. He is also the king of kings. 
Now, this provides him with legal authority to establish and advance the Father's kingdom and appoint lesser kings to continue the work. Now, who are the lesser kings? Take a look in the mirror. Well, that's my time for the day. What say you? I hope you enjoyed the ride today. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. Please take a second to like this post, share it with family and friends, and subscribe to this channel. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your